Hey, I'm Darini. We are here with Jim today. And Jim, got you. What do we have put on today for your wheel? Uh, we put on a uh, electric over hydraulic uh, yep. disc brake. Awesome. Kit. And I think we went with the Hydrostar as well we for your actuator Hydrostar. on the inside. Yes, so. we did. Well, cool. Why don't we go ahead and take a look on here. And some of those advantages of that hydraulic brake system is just going to be a little bit of a smoother ride, um, especially if you do have that proportional brake controller. And since you got the RAM there, I think you're all kind of taken care of with that. Right. Going to make for a smoother ride. And we actually did end up hiding it here over to the side, which is pretty nice. So we're still leaving a lot of room here in the front compartment for you, Jim, which is great because, you know, space is limited, of course, in our fifth wheels. And so we actually have it mounted up here on the side. We ended up using those two brackets we mentioned earlier here just to kind of suspend it there off to the side. So are you liking that just kind of getting out of the way? Absolutely do, yeah. Awesome. Out of the way cool. and uh, didn't take up any extra storage. So yeah, it's very good. Sweet, yeah. So a lot of our internal components are going to be kind of hidden right now, a little hard to see. Um, of course, you do have your bleeder valve at the top here, uh -huh. um, which can be really nice. Now, Dave's already gone ahead, your installer, got this all prepped up bled all that line for you. So nothing you're really gonna have to do at the start here, but if you do start noticing a little bit of, you know, a little bit of issue with it, you can go ahead and bleed those guys out. That way we're not having air sitting in our lines and then our brakes are working how we want them to. Sure. So gonna be a little hard to kind of see how all of our lines are being ran right now, um, but we kind of bring ourselves to the corner here and we kind of see how it's actually going to our brakes. All right. So we actually have our hydraulic hoses coming through here on the side of our compartment for our propane. Mm -hmm. And that's where we were talking about having that plastic bushing in place. Cause as we core that out, we don't want any sharp edges actually nicking oh, right, or right, right, cutting right. that hose. Yeah. So that's why we went ahead and put that guy in there, giving you a little more protection, which can be great. And I know you said it before, a concern with yours was having any kind of hose or anything exposed, you know, in an area. So that's why we're tucking up on the inside. And so our line is basically coming down the side of our fifth wheel here, all the way, of course, back to our brakes, which is great. And I believe you went with the Kodiak, didn't you, for that, yeah. uh, for that brake action, which is great. So, and again, those hydraulic brakes are a little more responsive than your normal, you had the drum brakes before you were saying, right? That's correct. Yeah, so is that kind of what led you even to kind of go this route? You were having trouble with just kind of feeling that weight behind you? No, it wasn't really trouble. Just okay. uh, um, had a trip last year to Tennessee and pulling the mountains and I, I could tell the the uh, electric disc, uh, excuse me, uh, drum brakes were getting a little spongy because they're getting warm. Yeah. And so uh, I wanted something a little bit more efficient. Yeah. Uh, and you could kind of feel that in the back of the truck, could, right? Uh, yeah. Kind of chugging on so Awesome. I wanted something that had better stopping yeah. power. And that's why we did this. Sweet. And that's exactly what we're going to get, right? We're going to have that electric response, which is therefore we're going to turn that into our brake fluid, which right. is going to push into our brakes. And then give us the braking power that we're looking for. And this is what our disc brakes look like when they're installed. You can see here we've, get, we've got our rotors that come in the kit. The rotors have the races pre-installed inside them. So when you remove your old assembly and the bearings and stuff off of there, um, it simplifies your installation because those races are installed in there. I do recommend replacing your bearings um, when making the swap over here, just because your old bearings have worn into the races in your drum and now you're introducing them to new races, it's best that you use two new parts so they can wear and match one another for the longest operation of, um, of them without running into issues. Switching over to a disc brake system is going to give you a shorter stopping distance and it's going to give you a more natural feeling brake application. It's going to be more similar to your regular truck and car that you drive around having a hydraulic operation. The actuators from Hydrostar, um, they're, they have a proportional activating valve inside of them that helps ensure that it applies the pressure evenly uh, towards all of our brake assemblies. And they really do a great job of just feeling um, much more confident that you're going to be able to stop uh, versus your old brake assemblies. These ones are also much easier to maintain. So over the years as you're driving your vehicle around, your shoes wear out um, on your drum assemblies, you've got hardware inside springs that can, uh, they weaken over time and they could potentially fall off and you don't have those working. You've got uh, adjusters on those that are designed to adjust the brakes out for the drum assemblies that often fail as well and they don't adjust. With our disc brake assembly here, it's a much simpler setup. So there's a lot less fail opportunities for failure with this. You've just got this big old hunk of metal right here for our rotor, nice spinning mass that we can grip on on both sides. We get more surface area to grab and we have that clamping force from that high hydraulic pressure. Uh, you also have more surface area here from the pads as well gri gripping 
on the rotor. So that's, that's kind of all what goes into reducing your stopping distance, getting that higher stopping power here. And then the, the maintenance thing, with, we don't have any of those parts. All that you really have here for this is you've got the, you know, the rotor, you've got your caliper, caliper bracket, and the pads. So as this wears down, your pads wear out, all you simply have to do is push your piston back in and replace those two pads. It's a significantly easier process to maintain these and keep them going. Drums, oftentimes I usually just tell people it's your best to just replace the entire assembly because uh, it's worth it in the amount of time that you're probably going to spend at home with uh, the limited tools and stuff. Because there's a lot of special tools that aren't required to do drum brakes, but boy does it make it easier. So now we've kind of covered some of the features on why this is an upgrade over your drum brakes, uh, kind of making things easier for you to drive, increasing your safety when in the vehicle. Let's, uh, let's head into getting this conversion uh, taken care of here. So we're gonna show you how to get those old drum brakes off, get these new ones on. Uh, we are gonna have videos um, for the components separately. So we're gonna have one on lines as well as the actuator. So you can check those out to see how to install those. And we're gonna show you how to get fluid back here to our calipers to get everything bled and operating. The rotors and brackets have a Dacromat finish on them to protect against rust and corrosion. And our caliper has a coat of guard on it. You can see the blue color that also helps to protect it from corrosion. These are designed to work with 5,200 to 6,000 pound axles with a number 42 spindle. And they're designed to work with wheel sizes of 15 inches or larger with a six on five and a half bolt pattern. It has a 12 inch rotor diameter and the brake flange that will attach to your axle that's going to replace your old drum assembly is a five bolt. So you want to just make sure you, you line those up. It has a half inch wheel stud diameter as well. So if you need to replace your studs, you can do so. Gosh, shit, that's not what I said. It has a half inch wheel stud diameter as well. So if you need to replace your lug nuts with matching ones, you can do that as well. Now, one thing you might notice about this assembly here that's a little bit different is the end of it here. Instead of when we put this back together, going back together with grease, we upgraded this to an oil bath system. And that's what you see here on the end. If you're wanting to go to oil bath as well, you can get the ProLube XL kit just like we did. And it comes with the ends here. These drive into the end. So you get a nice uh, oil, oil tight seal here. And then you've got your caps here and that's your fill for the oil that's inside of there. And if we spin it here, you can kind of see the oil moving around inside of there. So with an oil bath, this is just a little bit heavier duty design than the grease. You get better heat dissipation with the oil so it helps keep your components cool and the oil is able to get in there and just keep everything well lubricated so we don't have any metal to metal contact. And it's a similar operation to the grease. Again, it's just mainly temperatures that we're able to keep down better with the oil bath system. Along with this kit, which gives us our calipers and our, uh, all of our conversion for the brake mechanisms here. We're also going to be using a flexible line kit from Kodiak because we need hydraulic pressure for our system for it to operate. And we're also gonna be using Hydrostar's 1600 PSI actuator to activate everything. All right, we're gonna begin our installation for our brakes here by getting our trailer on a nice level surface. We need to get it jacked up so our wheels are off the ground so you can spin them like this. Uh, the way we did this is we just got some jack stands and we're using the factory stabilizer jacks at the front just to support the front of it and then we lifted it by the back and you guys if you've got a heavy enough jack at home you should be able to do this uh, at home now one of the things you may want to consider is before you lift it up is breaking the lug nuts loose if you don't have a, an, an impact um, once you lift it up it's really hard to break these loose by hand because the wheel wants to spin if you've got an impact then you should be able to zip them right off without that being an issue uh, but if you don't just crack those loose. You don't take them all the way off, just, just a turn or so, just to make it easier to remove them once you lift it up. We're using a 19 millimeter socket to remove the lug nuts on this one. Yours may be slightly different um, on your trailer at home. And sometimes these are, he's got like chrome caps on them. It's not uncommon for the chrome caps to kind of want to twist on there. Corrosion builds up under them. Uh, if it gets stuck in your socket because of that, I always just thread it on a turn or two like that. And then you can take your gun here, put it on there and just kind of wiggle it up and down to get it off of there.
All right, we got all our lug nuts removed. We can then just set our wheel aside out of our way here. And we're just gonna roll that over there. We're gonna remove the other wheel for this side as well. It removes the same way. We already got that off of there. And now that we're down to our brake assembly here, we can start to get these old brake components removed. What I usually like to do to help keep things neat, I'll keep some shop towels or shop rags handy. I like to keep one down here so I got a place to set all of my components as I disassemble. because These are all gonna be covered in grease. Uh, so you wanna try to keep your area clean or else you're gonna be tracking this, stepping in and tracking it inside your house, inside your motor home, you know. So just cleanliness helps out a lot. We're gonna then grab our flat bladed screwdriver and a hammer so we can remove the cap. And the cap's got a little lip around it there. It's usually, sometimes you can't just tap these off of there, but I find it usually easier if we uh, take our flat bladed screwdriver here and just kind of get it right in between the two pieces. And you can kind of just kind of pry it out a little bit. We'll just work our way around just like that to get that to pop out. And we'll just keep prying it out with our screwdriver here. There we go. And then we'll just set that down on our rag. Below that, we've got our nut and our retainer. The retainer has to come off first, so we're gonna grab some channel locks and we're gonna grab the retainer and just pull that straight off. And then we'll remove the nut next. And you might notice something here. You can tell that this has been, uh, someone has been in here to service it at one point. Um, we can see this because of the different types of grease that's been used. And you should try to always use the same type of grease that you've got in there. If you mix various types of grease, they can have slightly different chemical structures and it could cause the grease to break down. And the way I know that he's been using two different types of grease is because we can see the red, typical red wheel bearing grease around here. And then in the center where the Easy Lube is here, he's been putting marine grease, it looks like in there with that green color. Um, so it's, we don't know the exact brands, so it's possible that these greases are compatible with the, each other and it's fine. Um, but I usually try to stick with the same exact brand and type if I can to ensure that we don't cause any issues. So we're going to be converting this over to an oil bath setup, uh, so we're not gonna even going to have grease on this once we're done. So now that we've got that nut removed, behind that we've got our washer and our outer bearing there. I take my screwdriver and I like to set it right in there. Our hub will then slide off. We're not gonna take it all the way off just yet, just out enough to get that bearing to drop onto our screwdriver. And then we can set that down. We're gonna separate the washer from the back of the bearing because we're gonna reuse the washer, but we are not gonna be reusing the bearing. And you can see here, the grease is pretty black. It looks like it may have got some contaminants in it. And it's possible that it was breaking down because of the different types. Uh, we're gonna be get putting all new bearings and stuff like that in there. So we're gonna be fixing any issues that might've occurred. So now we can just pull the whole hub assembly off. And we're just pulling straight out with it. And then we can drop it down and set it aside. We need to get our backing plate out of the way. I'm um, gonna just clean up this a little bit to minimize the mess. So we'll get some of this grease off of here. All right, kind of get the bulk of that out of the way. And then we'll now remove the backing plate here. So there's five studs that run through that are connected uh, to the axle there. We're gonna remove the nuts on those. And you can see there's wiring here that passes through wall, so I have to disconnect the wiring. We're gonna use a 9 16th socket to remove each of these nuts. I recommend an extension for your tool if you've got it just to keep you away from kind of the mess and brake dust keep and keep clean. All right, now that we've got all the nuts removed, the assembly will slide off of there, but it is still attached with those wires. Just give it a little bit of a kick there. Sometimes the rust and corrosion kind of seals it on there, so Break it loose, that's kind of the easiest way. And we're gonna slide it back just a little bit just to make it easier to access the wires on the back side here. 
And then we're just gonna go ahead and snip these off of here. Got our snips right here. So we're just going to the back side. I could probably twist it here so you can see that a little better. Wiring's only gonna go so far, so can't twist it too much further than that. But here we can see on the back side, here's our two circuits. I'm just cutting it there and there, cutting the two wires. This particular backing plate here also has this little clip on it right there. So we're just gonna pull that clip out of there, just grabbing my needle nose. And we're just kind of giving it a little bit of a twist there just to remove that wiring from the back of it. We can then take our brakes out and set those aside. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the assembly here and I'm gonna set it right back into the rotor to help minimize the space that all of our old parts here are gonna take up. But before I do that, um, I already know which bearings we're gonna need, but if you were unsure uh, when you're going to purchase your, your new setup, which bearings and stuff you're gonna need for your spindles, this is the time to check. So what you'll wanna do is grab your bearing if you're planning on replacing it, which I highly recommend if you're gonna do this, because you're gonna have new races and these bearings have worn into the previous races. So um, it's best to have both new components. So we're just wiping off the back side of it there and that'll reveal the number on it there. It's an LM67048. So now we know what size bearing this is. Uh, and the main thing is you wanna know that part number so you know the inner diameter. Um, Cause a lot of times when you upgrade to the heavier duty disc brakes, you're gonna get a slightly heavier duty bearing. It still needs to have the same inside diameter so it slides over the spindle, um, but it might be a little bit thicker uh, for being a little bit heavier duty. And we are gonna be putting slightly heavier duty ones on today uh, than these ones here. Now, as far as our other ones go for the inner, to see those, you'd have to remove the seal here. And the seal just pops out of the back here. We're not gonna be reusing our, our drum or anything, so we can just grab in here with our channel locks and get under it and pop it up. We're not trying to save the seal or anything like that either. So, that's fine. And then once you pop that out of there, you can then access the bearing that's inside. We're gonna be doing the exact same thing. You're just popping it out of there. Again, to avoid mess, we're gonna use that screwdriver. And if you wipe off the back side of this one, you'll also find your numbers on there. And this one we can see here is a 25580. And that's the exact size we're gonna be using uh, for our new assembly there. So that's how you can check those if you just wanted to do that at home. It's a good idea to check that beforehand. Um, if you're unsure about what size you need to order, you can verify that there. So now we're just take the assembly here. I'm just dropping it down into the drum. That way those pieces kind of stay together. We can just slide that whole setup off to the side. So here we've got now our kind of bare setup. Our wires here, we're gonna uh, probably just tuck these inside the axle. Maybe I'll zip tie them to the axle. That way they'll still be there. We're not gonna be using them anymore, but if for whatever reason, uh, the customer ever needed to access this wiring again, and still be there for them. So now we're gonna get this all cleaned up. We're just gonna grab some brake clean and get that all wiped down because of the various brake dust. And it looks like our seal might've been seeping a little bit. Looks like we got a little bit of grease that was coming out of the seal. So I always wanna make sure this is nice and clean. Cause again, we're converting this to an oil bath uh, on this particular setup we're gonna be doing. You don't have to, you can still stick with grease. And regardless, I would still recommend cleaning this all up to make sure that our new seal has a good surface to ride on and that there's no contaminants in there. All right, so we got this all cleaned up. We can go ahead and get our bracket installed now. Um, the bracket, if you look in your manual, has a couple of different orientations it can go in based on the size of your axle. Um, ours is gonna fall under the, under the 8,000 pound category. So we're gonna put ours at facing the rear, our caliper mount needs to face the rear of our trailer. Uh, the ones that were heavier would sit on top like that, but ours is the lighter. So it's gonna go in this orientation here. That'll just slide right on your hub there, on your axle, and then we'll take the same nuts that was holding on our drum brake assembly to attach this. And if you look at this plate here, it does have a label on it. 
where it says outside. You want to make sure that you're able to read that. If you can't read it from here on the outside, then you've got it backwards. You just need to flip that around. We can then zip those down. And then we're also going to torque them to the manufacturer's specifications. All right, now we've got our disc, our rotor here to uh, assemble before we go to put it on. This kit here is what we're going to be using to convert it over to a uh, oil bath system. So this is the oil that we're going to be using. It comes in the kit. You also get new caps so we're not going to be using the ones that we've removed here we're going to be using these now i will say that with this kit and what i found especially with these particular rims that we had removed on this one these stick out further than what the other caps do and the center caps on your rims may contact the cap here on the ones that we've got here they uh they will contact the cap so just keep that in mind um, you may have that issue at home if you have the exact same type of looking rims the seals also come included in this kit, and it's necessary that you have these seals if you're going to oil bath. There's, there are a special seal that's different from uh, this type of regular grease seal. So yeah, we're gonna be using these. Um, so we're just gonna open this up here, because we need the oil first, so that way we don't go together completely dry. And we also need to grab our seal out of here, because that's gonna go on right after we put our bearing in. So we're just grabbing our oil out of there, grabbing one seal, we'll set the rest of it aside over there. Now we're going to grab our, our new bearing here, the exact same number as we had before, 25580. It's just going to drop right down inside of there. Now I don't want to go just in just yet, I always like to put a little bit of oil on it so that way it's uh, not going in completely dry. We may have to, looks like we have to remove the seal from the top of the bottle there so i'm just putting a little bit of the oil on there kind of spinning it around trying to help let it seep in there we go and then i'm going to kind of rub it in with my fingers a little bit try to get it around those rollers and onto the inner race inside of there and that's pretty much good enough we just just trying to prevent any dry contact and then we just drop it down in there. Make sure you do put it the right way. We want the smaller diameter end to face towards the inside of the rotor. And now we can grab our seal and we're gonna drive that in. And with this, I like to put a little bit of oil on the seal as well, just to help it drive in a little bit easier. So we're just gonna put a little bit here on the back side. We don't need nearly as much with this. Just kind of run your finger around it. Just helps it slide in easier. All right, and then after you get that lubed up, you'll set that on there and then you'll drive it in. Now I would recommend using a seal driving kit. We've got them available here at eTrailer, but I'll show you a couple of methods that you can use um, if you don't have that kit. All right, so if you don't have a seal driving kit, you can take a block of wood like this that extends all the way across and we can use that to drive it straight down because ideally we want to drive this straight in. we don't want to go crooked so as you're driving it in kind of pay attention if you got a spot that rises a little bit try to counteract that and now you guys at home that probably have mechanical and have serviced your brake assemblies before Replace bearings and seals. Normally, once you get the seal drove in there, flush with the back, you think, okay, well, I'm done. I got a little spot here that's still raised I got to get. But usually when you get it flat, you think, hey, I'm done. But actually on these disc uh, brake conversions, it needs to be driven in further than flush. So we're going to get it flush first. There we go. And when you look down on here, it looks nice and flush now, but there's actually a small chamfer that runs around the metal surface here on the inside. We need to get our seal down to where it's um, the top edge of the seal is at the bottom edge of that chamfer. 
So now you kind of need a seal driving kit, but what you can use if you don't have one, remember that bearing that we'd removed from our uh, old one here, our old bearing? I don't really recommend using the bearing to drive it in, but you can take the race that's inside the drum there and you can drive that out and that works pretty good as a driving surface because we get nice contact all the way around. It's small enough that it will fit inside uh, the rotor hole there. And then we'll just use our block of wood once again. And we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna just check, make sure that we're not going in perfectly straight. We're gonna counteract that. And just take your time, a couple of taps at a time, because we're pretty close right there. You can already see that chamfered edge. This side right here is almost perfect. This side here needs to go down just a little bit more. And that's feeling pretty good there. We'll tap right here maybe. And yeah, now we're all the way down, um, fully seated. You can see that chamfered edge all the way around. That's kind of what we're looking for. Our bearing here should still be able to spin. And you can see there it can spin. We're not crushing it with the seal. So that's exactly what we were looking for right there. So we're just about ready to slide this um, onto here. But to prep ourselves a little bit, we're gonna clean up some of our old hardware here. So the, the nut, the washer, and the retainer, go ahead and get all those wiped down. We want those to be clean. We don't wanna transfer any of our grease over. And then this is our outer bearing. I just wanted to show you it is a different size than the one that we took off. It has the same inside diameter, but it's a little bit thicker, heavier duty bearing. And this is a 15123. This is the appropriate bearing that matches up with our disc brake rotor. So it's important uh, that both components, everything matches up, that this inner diameter is gonna be compatible with our spindle and that the rotor is gonna be compatible. Um, the race inside the rotor is gonna be compatible with the uh, rollers here on the bearing. So it comes pre-installed with the race on the disc brakes. We don't have to worry about any of the races. We just gotta make sure that this inner diameter is gonna be uh, appropriate here. And that's, that's what this bearing does is for us. This is the appropriate size. We're gonna put oil on this one as well because we don't wanna put this one in dry too. So we're gonna get all those things prepped real fast, get that stuff cleaned up, get this guy oiled, and then we'll grab our assembly here so we can slide it on. All right, so we got all of our parts prepared here. We're now gonna grab the rotor assembly. Uh, actually, real quick, before I grab the rotor assembly, I'm gonna put just a dab of oil on my finger. And I'm just gonna even put just a little bit here on the spindle. This will just help the parts slide together a little bit easier when we go to slide that on here. Some of these newer parts and stuff, uh, it's such a tight tolerance. It doesn't go perfectly straight. It's ever so slightly cocked. Um, you can get into kind of a binding situation. So this just helps minimize that. Now we're gonna grab our assembly and we'll slide it into place. And you wanna be careful when sliding it in. We don't wanna nick the seal on anything. So we're gonna to try to be very careful to line up the hole and slide it in. It's like a game of operation. Don't touch the sides. And this is what we were talking about, that bearing kinda of little stiff the newer bearings, so you might have to push it up just a little bit there. Okay, now we've got that slid on. We'll take our new bearing. I already got that prepared and oiled. Slide that in place. Cleaned up washer. We'll go right behind that. And then we'll take our nut here, thread it into place. And then after we get our nut on there, we're gonna use the nut to ensure that this is fully seated. So grab your channel locks, go ahead and clean any grease off at the end of those. And then just go ahead and tighten this down. Now the, we're gonna tighten this fully. This isn't where we're gonna leave it in the end. Well, again, we're just trying to make sure we've got all of our components fully seated. And I like to just kind of spin the rotor assembly with it just to make sure everything's kind of sliding and falling into place.
All right, so that's, that felt like the end there. Just put a little bit of extra oomph on it just to make sure that everything is fully seated. It should feel kind of stiff here when you give it a little bit of a turn. We don't want to turn it too much. That's what we're looking for. We know we are fully seated now. Now we're gonna back it off. And it should be fully loose to where you can turn it by hand. And we're gonna turn it just until it touches by hand, just like that. And that's where we kind of want our bearings to be set. That way they, they don't have like a preloaded pressure on them that's causing them to grind into each other. They've got the freedom they need uh, to ride, but we don't have excess play in there that can cause any, any damage from the components moving around. So that's right where we want to be. Should feel nice and smooth when you turn it. Our retainer will go on next. And sometimes you do have to turn the nut just a little bit left or right here to get the retainer to go back on. You see there's a flat surface here. It lines up with the flat surface on the spindle. And then these kind of, these guys here, um, by either laying on a flat surface or one of the corner edges will go in between these two little prongs. So we're just gonna see if we can get it to line up and push it in place there. And again, every now and then you gotta turn the nut just a little bit in order to get it to the right position that's gonna uh, allow it to go all the way on. Looks like we're pretty close though. Um, when you get it real close like this and you're almost all the way down but it's stuck, you can usually just take your screwdriver and the palm of your hand and just tap it in the rest of the way. Just like that, there, there we go. All right, we've got our retainer on there. So at this point now, we are, we would be putting uh, the old cap on and, and filling this up with grease. Um, if we were doing grease, um, we oiled our bearings before we put them in. I would have packed them with a bearing packer uh, with grease before that. Uh, so if you are doing grease, make sure you pack those bearings first um, when we were doing the oiling portion of the bearing. And then now you can fill that up and uh, put your cap on. But we're gonna be changing it over to that oil bath. So we're gonna grab our new caps here from our oil bath kit. Grab the cap out of there. Unscrew the end of it there. We'll set this aside for a minute. I'm gonna grab our oil once again. I'm gonna put just a little tiny bit on here just to make it easier to get it to insert. Just run it around the edge there a little bit. All right. And now we're gonna drive this into our rotor assembly. And this part here is a bit of a challenge just because this is such a tight fit. It needs to be a very tight fit or else our oil would leak out. So we're pressing this basically into our assembly. So I'm just kind of getting myself lined up. You're really gonna have to get a good whack at it to get this thing to go into place. So kind of move a few things out of the way so you can get a good drive at it. We're gonna use our wood block once again. Kind of get it lined up on there. If you can, I like to start with the hammer by itself and see if I can get it to just kind of grab enough to hold itself on there. It just makes life a little bit easier if it's staying on there by itself. Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. You know, we'll just see. That seems pretty decent. We'll now uh, drive it into place with our block of wood here. All right, that looks pretty decent. Give her a spin, make sure that it's fully seated all the way around. And that all looks pretty good. We can now take that cap that we had removed a minute ago. I like to put just a dab on my finger and just smear it around the seal. Um, that can just help prevent any like nicks and cuts on your seal. We don't want to get it on all the threads if we can avoid it. I mean, it doesn't really matter. It's going to get oiled anyway, but I'm just trying to get a little bit on the seal just to make sure it slides in without any tears or cuts. Next, we're going to install the caliper that comes in your kit. When you get pull this out of the box, first thing I like to do to make it install easier, the slide pins that we see here, 
if you see them protruding towards the uh, the pads here, we're just gonna push that slightly towards the uh, outside. So I'm just kind of grabbing the inside of that slide and then just pushing it in a little bit. Just give us some clearance. The other side, we'll just double check that one. Let's push that one as well if we need to. And that looks good. If your pad slides out of there, you can just push it back in. We'll then take our bolts and slide those through. And then we can lift our caliper up here. We want the bolts to slide out like that uh, so they clear. The reason why we put them in there though, the bottom one you really don't have to put in, um, but the top one, a lot of times the leaf spring is in the way of being able to insert the bolt. So you just gotta have it pre-installed and then just push it back like that a little bit. We're then just gonna slide our caliper over our uh, disc rotor there. The rotor is gonna slide in between the pads just like this. And then our hole should line up with that bracket that we installed. We'll then just thread them right in. Yeah. Just falls right in there. Line up your holes. Get those started. And then we'll tighten this down with a half inch socket or wrench. And after you got them snugged down, torque them to the specifications outlined in your instructions. We're going to go ahead and fill up our rotor with oil or again if you're doing the grease you want to make sure you grease them. We're just using our screwdriver to help us pop out this little center cap. It's really really tight in there. And then we'll open up our bottle. The end just barely will fit in there. You kind of got to give it a twist a little bit and then we can fill that on up. And we're going to go ahead and spin it to help it kind of work its way throughout the system. And put just a little bit more in there. Grab our cap here and put that on. Now it may look like we're slightly overfilled, but the oil, the thickness of it, it takes it a while to kind of work its way through the system because of its thickness. It's not like water, it doesn't fill in the gaps 100% immediately. There's some air pockets and things that get in there uh, due to the thickness of the oil that just makes it take a little bit longer to kind of settle. There we go. Push that back on there. So you can see on the face of it, there's a fill line here. It's kind of a dotted line. We're a little bit above the fill line right now. Um, but as you spin this thing and as it sits here, that oil is going to work its way through all those little cavities, getting all the air worked up uh, to the top and stuff. So that way it'll settle down. And well, it will likely end up being lower than the recommended fill line. So um, this is kind of something I would recommend is let it sit overnight. And then the next day recheck it and top it back off then. Um, so we're going to go ahead and move on now. This, this side here we've got installed. So we can repeat the same procedure for the other side of this axle. And we're going to go ahead and do the other axle as well. All the steps are going to be exactly the same. Um, once we get all those installed, then we can install the lines for our system as well as our hydraulic actuator. Those don't come included with the kit, but we do sell all that here at eTrailer. We're going to be using Hydrostar's 1600 PSI actuator for this installation, and we're also going to be using uh, a flexible line kit, which is kind of neat. I like the flexible lines because it's much easier to install. Uh, you need less tools, uh, solid lines, you have to bend them yourself. The flexible lines are gonna make your job a lot easier. We'll then just tighten this down into our caliper here. All right, and our line is gonna do the exact same thing uh, for that three-way. So we've got that one over here. And then this one here I left loose to show you guys um, tightening it down. When you tighten these down, it's important to use the appropriate tool. Here I've got a 3 8 wrench and here I've got a 3 8 line wrench. They are, look a little bit different. You can see this one here has got a uh, little bit more surface area that kind of wraps around the opening compared to our regular wrench. 
the end of the line. It is a double flared uh, end there that'll seal it right into the flared end there. So just poke that in there and thread the fitting right into it. And this is made of a, a softer metal. And it's made of a softer metal because we want that those these metal pieces to kind of form and seal to one another. So this 3 8 line, this 3 8 wrench here, if you were to just use this wrench, what most likely will happen is we will strip out our line here. And then you're going to have a difficult time tightening it down and getting it loose again to, to repair it. Very easy to damage your lines uh, with this because of the, the tightening. And these have to be tightened down pretty tight to work on our trailer, usually tighter than what it is on your car. If you guys are worked, used to work on your car at home, these usually have to be tighter because that actuator at the front for these disc brakes can go up to 1600 PSI. So um, when we go to, we're going to deadhead it and we're going to make sure we test it to be able to handle that kind of pressure. So when I tighten this down, it's okay to start with this wrench if you want, but as soon as you feel it kind of hit the end, you don't want to use this guy anymore. It's time to move on to our line wrench so we don't damage the line. Now, when using your line wrench, you'll simply get, you can see how it slides over the line there, and then we can line it up to tighten this down. And we're just gonna snug this down. It's always a good idea to support uh, your fittings if you can. So we're gonna use an adjustable wrench here, um, just, just to give a little bit of support, so that way when we're tightening this, we don't accidentally damage it. And if you need line wrenches, you can get those here at E-Trailer. We've got some available from Performance Tools. And that's all we're doing. We're just making sure we get this nice and snug. Just like that. If we were to use that regular wrench, there's a chance we would have gotten it tight enough, but there's also a good chance that we would have damaged the fitting. And if it wasn't tight enough and you damage your fitting there, uh, you may not be able to get it tight enough, even with a line wrench at that point, because you've kind of ruined the structure of it. So definitely make sure you get the appropriate one. We're using 3 8 uh, sizes for those. All right, guys, so we are back up here at our actuator now. We finished installing our line kit. Our actuator's all wired up. Our brakes have been converted over from the old drums to the uh, caliper and disc set up. At this point, we just gotta get the, uh, all the air out of the system and get the lines fully bled full of brake fluid. We're gonna be using DOT3 brake fluid for this. I've removed the cap up there and I took a little napkin and I wrapped it around it to catch anything that I spill because this is a pretty um, it's a pretty strong chemical that's inside of here, the uh, brake fluid. It really likes to eat paint and stuff, so you want to try to avoid getting this on things. It's not the best to get on your skin either. It kind of dries you out a little bit, so uh, you should try to avoid that as well. So we're just going to top this up. I got a light up there shining down inside of it so I can see, so we, we try not to overfill it too much. And you're probably gonna need a couple of these bottles here. That was a partially used bottle there, about half of it. And then we're gonna open up the next one here, start filling this up. We got a total of three bottles here. Um, we're probably gonna use two completely and then partial of that third one. So just keep that in mind. These are about 12, 12 ounce sizes. All right, we, I can see the level there. Uh, we're almost all the way to the top. That's where we wanna be. Your cap here, you can just leave that sitting right there. You don't want to put that back on. If we, if we leave the cap on, we bleed them. This rubber seal in here, as it's sucking the fluid out, as we're kind of bleeding that out, uh, the lower pressure that's in here um, from us pushing it down will actually suck this uh, seal out of the cap. And it is kind of designed to extend out some, but if you suck it all the way out of there, you can damage the seal on the cap, and uh, then you get air, can get air in your system and stuff. So just leave that cap off of there to avoid damaging it. And now we're going to have to enlist ourselves an assistant to help us bleed these brakes. Because one person, that'll be me, I'm going to be back at the brake assembly to open up the bleeder. Your assistant, though, will either need to be at the front of your trailer here to pull the breakaway switch pin, which would activate the actuator, or you can plug it into your vehicle. We're going to be using a test box, which simulates uh, a brake controller output. If you plug it into your vehicle, you can use the manual slide on your brake controller to activate this as well. Uh, so your assistant could be doing that. Uh, so we're going to grab somebody here real quick to uh, operate our test box, which acts like the brake controller. So we're back here at our brakes. We've got our assistant up there at the front. 
I've hooked up a hose on here. If you got a clear one, that's a little bit easier so you can uh, see the fluid that's coming out of it. And it's just draining into a bottle we got over there. We just drilled a little hole in the top to funnel it into there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna open this bleeder up. I've got a 5 16th wrench here. I'm opening the bleeder and then our assistant's gonna activate it. So go ahead, Shane. He activates it and then it's pumping some fluid out. I'm gonna go ahead and close it off there. Okay, Shane. And we closed it off, we got some fluid out, but the reason why we closed it is because the pump up there moves a lot of fluid very fast. So after you have it open for a couple of seconds, you probably wanna shut it off and check the level of the fluid inside of your actuator. If the actuator goes dry, you have to start this whole process all the way over. And all we're gonna be doing is just repeating exactly what we did, but taking a break in between here and double checking that fluid level to make sure it stays topped up. We're just gonna rinse and repeat this procedure until we get clean, clear fluid coming out of here with no bubbles inside of it. Okay, ready? So we can see that we got bubbles in it. It's coming out. That's looking pretty clean there. So we're gonna go ahead and close it off. All right, so we got that closed. So we can double check our fluid level. If everything looks good there on the fluid level, we're gonna move on to the next break and just repeat that until we get clear fluid through. Once we get all clear fluid through, we'll probably come back to this one just one more time just to double check to make sure we got all the air out of it. All right, so we went around and we finished bleeding the brakes. After this one, we moved up to that one, then we moved across to the other side to bleed both of those. When starting bleeding your brakes, I do recommend starting at the furthest caliper away from your actuator at the front. So we've got the actuator stalled on the left front side. So we're on the right rear here, starting with this one. That just gets the majority of the lines bled uh, with this first one here. And then you're just kind of taking up the last little bit going to each individual caliper. So yeah, we got all that done. At this point now, we are ready to check for any leaks that we may have. This is a very high pressure system. And the way to check for leaks is we're gonna pull the breakaway switch pin. That's gonna just deadhead our system, run it up to its max pressure, and we're gonna just check each fitting. So at each caliper, we're gonna check those. And at our three-way and our four-way T, we're gonna check those as well, and at the connection of the actuator. So I'm gonna go pull that pin, we'll grab our flashlight and just make sure we ain't got any leaks going on. All right, so we're back up here at the front. You guys are looking at the actuator. I'm pulling the breakaway switch pin now. The pump is activated. And we're looking right here at the fitting, getting real close up on it, making sure that there's no wet spots, that there's no drips, that's all good. We'll then move to the next fittings and just check those all the way back at each, every single one. All right, guys, with no leaks present, that pretty much finishes up our installation here. Um, if you want to just verify it's working properly, you can pull that pin and you should not be able to turn it when the system's activating and then you should be able to turn it when it's not activating, just like now, we're not activating. We've already tested it, we know that it holds. So at this point, you just get your wheels back on, make sure you get those torqued down to the manufacturer's specifications and you're ready to hit the road. All right, so we've gone ahead and hooked it up to our toter truck here that we use for moving around our trailers. We've got a brake controller installed on there. So as we pass on by here, we're gonna activate the brakes uh, so that we can see that it's gonna stop. It should stop the whole truck with just the power of the brakes on our trailer. And there it is. Just the power of the brakes on our trailer was able to stop the truck. So that's pretty much what we're looking for. We've got plenty of power there available. Go ahead and take off again and we'll just uh, activate them one more time just to make sure everything's working properly with them. And there we go, trailer stops the truck like it's nothing. And that completes our installation of Kodiak's electric over hydraulic disc brake conversion kit on our 2018 Shasta Phoenix.